All right, what's up guys? What's growing on? I've got a little bit of a follow-up for you on this food forest of Swales site that we did right around the corner from my farm. And as you look around here behind me, you'll see this is not typical Florida. This isn't perfectly flat ground. We have, you know, some real hills going on here. Just behind me to the south, this starts to slope up. You know, just behind me on the slope this south this side, this starts to slope down. And what's most epic is the site where we've been doing all the work has a south base slope and that's kind of the ideal situation for growing you know slowing the water down having the right sun and i want to show you some of the work that we've been doing here lately so i've been working on this site for almost about exactly two years now and we've been working on this far south end of the property this is a two acre site the home site's on an acre and this lot was on an acre and when we originally started on this this was all thick brush scrub oaks invasive species um, you know, just you couldn't even get in here with the bush hog. And what we've done here is we've kind of created a food forest slash personal botanical garden. And something I really want to point out, you know, pulling up here this morning, there's this smell of fish in the air. And I know that Dan was just out here this morning, probably spraying some fish emulsion on the plants. And, you know, for me as an installer, designer, um, these are kind of like the ideal clients. Penny and Dan are beyond cool. Um, you know, they've kind of grabbed the torch here on this project and they've taken off with it and they really don't need us for a lot. Um, you know, we come back here maybe once to twice a year to do some heavy pruning, to expand upon the project, maybe add some plants, maybe help them with some weeding. But for the most part, like I said, they've really, they've grabbed the torch and they've ran with it. I mean, they've, they've gotten plants here in this system up by the house um, for attracting butterflies that I've never even seen before. I've only read about, um, you know, you read about a lot of these different host plants and you know, they all sound great. We want to find them, but they're almost impossible to find. You know, you might find this nursery that has one, this nursery that has one. Well, they've been going to these little individual nurseries and picking up one here and one there. And they've really got into the butterflies, um, really got into the whole system. I mean, to be honest with you, they own a small tractor now, they have a golf cart. You know, this has become a lifestyle a hobby um you know definitely something that's become a passion for them and that's what i love to see i love to see it when you know the client really grabs a hold of this and kind of runs with it you know it's really exciting for me as the installer so i'll shut up I'll show you guys some plants so this was our latest extension and you know we put this bamboo in over here last year we actually relocated it from the swale down there and it is a semi-dwarf variety that's about a 25 foot variety but they wanted something even shorter over there, more like 15 foot. Actually, they had some threats from the power company. Power company came in and said they're cutting everything down to six foot. They said, this doesn't grow past 20 feet. They said, it doesn't matter. So we put a shorter variety over there. They're gonna keep, kind of keep it hedged. And we put the taller variety over here where there is no power line, so we don't have that problem. Um, but what we've done here is, you know, we've just recently cleaned out all these oak trees. We've left one or two thick patches, just trying to give them some privacy up towards the side of their house but we created a giant native buffer here. And it's not all just natives. There are some olive trees mixed in here, um, maybe a couple of loquats. I'm starting to use a lot more of that vetiver grass. That's an excellent crumping grass. Kind of find it doing a little better than the Fakahatchee grass. The roots are supposed to go like 15 foot on that plant. You know, so the whole idea, you know, before we started this, this was all pure sand. And you know, when I say pure sand, this is what the ground looked like when I got here. You know, this entire lot had erosion problems, overland flow. I mean, where you see this big washout right here, this was everywhere on the property and we've completely stopped that with the system that we've installed. You know, so what was happening was they were getting those heavy rains and all of that rain was pulling that organic matter off the top layer of soil and bringing it down here to the bottom of the hill. And what we're doing now, we're keeping all of that material in the soil profile up here in the garden area. So it's definitely, I mean, it's made some major improvements. You know, and I think when I even brought Justin Rhodes here, he named his video increasing property value by 25% with permaculture design. And I don't know if that's quite correct, but what I can tell you is they've definitely increased the property value from having a overgrown lot, you know, to a botanical garden next to their house. When they go to sell this, this is a selling point. Somebody's gonna see value in this. I mean, they could put a barn up over here, keep their boat here if they really wanted to pavilions, ponds, you know, we're talking about adding all different types of elements to this garden here for the long term, but there's definitely more property value just by having this cleaned up, much less having the edibles or the botanicals added in. So there's definitely a 25% increase in value 
not sure if it was just the permaculture design, but I think it was more of just the cleanup. I mean, you know, an overgrown piece of property is gonna cost money to get brought back to a state that we want it, right? So there's definitely a lot of value been added here in the system. Some of the other species we have in here are Vitex, um, nitrogen fixing calyandras, dwarf firebush, sweet almond, scorpion tail, lots of that sunshine mimosa. You guys know I love using that nitrogen fixing ground cover. Some cat whiskers, Simpson stopper. As it gets more shady and towards the back, we have things like Turk's cap, spiral ginger, um, gall and gall. Uh, there's some malanga, there's some taro. And let's see what else is growing on down here. We did bring in some different species of bamboo. They actually have some rare passion fruits they had in pots that we put in here along the fence. There's a couple of them in a few spots. And as we get further down, we brought some coral honeysuckle to actually add in. Um, I've had to take a second here to think about the varieties of bamboo that we met, uh, we added to this. This one over here, there's six or seven pieces of what's called RG Dwarf. That's a newer variety. I had a couple in the nursery, but I've really never planted them out for clients. So I was able to find them for this install. And then when we get down here on this end, we put the Alphonse Carr variety. So that has a yellow stem with a green stripe. And that one gets to be about 20 foot, 15 foot. It's more of a dwarf variety also. Um, along the back here, this will end up being a nitrogen fixing buffer of wax myrtle because it gets tall. So it's planted all the way up against the oaks. And as we walk forward, we have sporadic, like I said, vetiver grass, a couple of olives, some sweet almonds. Um, I'm seeing tropical sage. And then some neat natives that, you know, the clients had in pots, like the ones I had talked about for the butterflies, like this tick plant. Um, you know, that's something I've seen in books. Never actually personally planted or had in my own garden something they had up behind the house and what they said they really liked about it is you know it makes these beautiful little sunflowers it was one of the first things that started flowering this year and it's never stopped flowering so we're excited to tie that loose to the trellis kind of let it open up but when we originally installed it it was kind of laying over so we do have a little stake on that something kind of holding that guy up there's also some sporadic elderberry mixed in here for pollination and we have lots of that I would want to say scorpion tail, tropical sage, and cat whiskers kind of coming here along the front. We also dug up some pups, and you guys are going to be just shocked to see how well the bananas are doing here. You know, this site is a little bit further north of me, um, and you know, they probably have 10 racks of bananas hanging. So everything that we're looking at here on the ground is sunshine mimosa, mimosa strigulosa, nitrogen fixing ground cover, beautiful, beautiful purple flowers. Um, multi or um, dwarf fern leaf ba bamboo interplanted with lemongrass and the lemongrass were here they were actually in some pots up by the back of the house we split them up and planted them and inters planted here on the swale so something else i point out to you i told you guys i just got done doing another extension here on the food forest um, everything to the left of the gate is about two years old everything from the gate to the end of this swale is about a year and a half old and everything from the end of the swale to the end of the fence is about two weeks old. Um, in the first stage of this, we had to bring in a lot of mulch, local tree mulch. Second stage of this, we started to get some mulch for some tree surfaces. Third stage of this, we actually spread a couple hundred yards of mulch for free from a tree company. Um, actually, not just from a tree company, but one of these larger companies that's doing all these power lines that are above my heads. And like I mentioned, those same guys that wanted to chop down the bamboo have been in the neighborhood on contract work doing all the oaks, all the hardwoods, and they brought us almost every single pile here. So that was a huge cost savings, that material, these guys working in the area, getting our hands on that stuff and putting it right into the system. So I probably put six days in here, another 700 plants, a couple hundred yards of mulch, a couple days of tree work. You know, we did a lot of hauling and pulling out, but let me get in here and show you guys the exciting stuff and just show you how well you know, this two year old section is doing compared to this year and a half old section compared to brand new plants. I mean, that's days old right there. Um, and we had been getting really, really steady daily rains here for a while, um, literally just in the last week. That's kind of started to calm down for us a little bit. We did put a micro irrigation system in with this whole zone, actually two zones of micro irrigation. So this does have water. I think they're running it once in the morning and once at night right now for about 20 minutes a zone until this establishes and then we'll go ahead and cut that back. So as I walk around to get in the garden for y'all, I thought I'd point out this lot because 
literally this lot is the same exact size and a prime example of what we've done here across the street. This is what it looked like when I got here. Maybe not 100% exact, obviously no fence, some different size trees, things like that. But for the most part, the species are all the same and the overgrowth is about the same. So, and you guys can see from a overgrown lot to a botanical garden. And what I mostly wanted to point out over here was the dirt on the street. You know, the erosion problems, the overland flow. You know, this corner over here, we can't even get weeds and grass to take off. Sorry about the dog barking here. They seem to always find me when I show up with the camera. But as you can see, I mean, all of this organic matter from the leaves and the trees when they drop their leaves in the, you know, the fall, when those heavy rains come, all of that is washing off of this property and ending up, you know, in the ditch, down here on the street. Most of the silt isn't really showing right now, but this kind of just gives you an idea on what this looked like prior before we showed up. I see mulberry in there, turkey oak, live oak, scrub oak, pine trees, very, very, very similar species. And then boom, right here, what we've started to work our way into. So let's go in the backyard. I'll show you guys around a little bit. All right, guys, the gate was locked, so I had to go around the long way. And right now I'm up at the top of this hill. So I'm right behind Penny and Dan's house. So I'm kind of getting ready to walk into the area I've been working on. But before I get there, I want to show you guys their uh, butterfly garden growing on over here. So hold on. Usually by about midday, this place is just covered in butterflies. It's like a, you know, a, a literally a show or a demonstration. Um, you know, they're all dancing out here, going nuts. There's only some yellow ones and white ones that I see right now. But as you can see, they've kind of gotten into this. Um, and I will say before I got here, you know, those raised beds were here. So they were already kind of into gardening. They had an idea of it, but wanted to go kind of all out. And these big houses you guys see here in the back are actually pigeon houses. Um, we're in a unique area in Pasco County that's kind of like the pigeon district. And a lot of people here fly pigeons. Dan's dad was a famous pigeon flyer. They're not quite into it, but they have these neat houses that they use for storage. Those are the perennial pentas. There's milkweed in here, um, blue porter weed. Like I said, I see some tropical sage. There's also some species in here. I don't even know. I think I see the shrimp plant over there. That's the dwarf firebush over here in the back. This is the standard firebush and it is just on fire, literally. Surprised there's no butterflies here yet. It is still a little bit early. So let's walk down into this backyard and show you guys what's growing on. Here's a big cassia. Looks like there's some salvias in there. Maybe the popcorn cassia. They have some beautiful, beautiful passion fruit vines growing on the fence here. Um, the first part of the fence is in some type of jasmine. Oh, I see some different butterflies. Big salvia. But what's really awesome looking are these passion flowers over here. You guys are gonna freak out when you see this. Look at these guys. This is a native variety. I don't believe it's the Maypop. I think they have the Maypop over here on somewhere on the fence, but this is another native variety. I don't think it makes fruit, um, but just absolutely gorgeous, mind-blowing flowers. And that's kind of going all the way down the fence. We didn't plant that. I think we might have planted some on this side for them, but we did not plant that. You know, so they have an observation kind of deck, you could say, up here at the top of the garden. This is where they get to sit. You know, watch the butterflies, look out into the garden. And you know, as you're looking out, you don't feel like you're in Pasco County, Florida. You know, I get a vibe, you know, like I'm in Costa Rica or something here. You know, it's very tropical. When you look this way, there's definitely some pine trees. Um, but for the most part, you know, I see bananas and big leaves. You know, when I see that, I think tropical. And speaking of tropical, this is seriously tropical. Um, you know, this variety and shoot that you see on this bamboo, this is Dendrocalamus asper. And look at the size of that shoot. This variety of bamboo is super tropical and it freezes to the ground every year here. Um, but this is one that's in Eric Tonesmeyer's Perennial Vegetable book, which is probably one of the best books on perennial vegetables there is. And this is a top rated bamboo for edible shoots. So this is probably one of the best ones. I think it can even be eaten raw. Most probably need to be cooked. Um, but 
unbelievably tropical. I have it at my farm too. Um, it's a little more exposed here, but comes back every year. So I'll probably end up donating mine to Matt with what's ripening just because he has a much better chance of it, you know, growing to maturity there, getting big, being healthy. Wow, look at these hydrangea flowers. Woo! Like I said, there's no lack of beauty here, no lack of flowers here. I think this is a developed graceful clump. Very tight clumper, it gets to be about 25, 30 foot tall. And I think they're up to about 25, 30 clumping varieties of bamboo here. This is the shampoo ginger. Just showed you guys that at my farm recently. I'll show you again, because I can't ever stop squeezing this stuff. Very nice, mild, sweet scent. Feels great on your hands. It's almost like a lotion. Um, there's camellias in here. We did a little pruning on those. Native saw palmetto. More of that shampoo ginger. Some of the native beauty berry. Here's the beautiful berries on that. Calicarpa americana. Um, and this one supposedly has stronger, deet re stronger bug repellent properties than DEET. I heard the military is working with it. The berries are edible. They definitely require a bit of sugar to get some sweetness. Chickens will eat them out though also. Pretty plant in the landscape. It's definitely something I do in native landscapes. I like to add if it's not there already. This was here. We did not add. Some more beauty berry. I see shampoo, ginger, obviously bananas. And like I said, this whole place kind of has a fish emulsion smell to it this morning. You know, Dan was out here doing some foliar applications on the plants. We've got some malanga, I see firebush back in here. Um, Buddha belly bamboo, definitely very tropical. We've got some butterflies dancing over here on this firebush. And I think some of the most impressive things in this system are probably the ground covers. Um, the mimosa and the peanut just really, really crush it here. This is all Fakahatchee grass. And let me show you all something. Like I was just here 10 days ago. That's a cut that you guys see on the top of that Fakahatchee grass from our large pruning shears. And that's how much this one has already grown back. So the whole thing was cut to the same height. I bet you it's grown back 12 or 14 inches already. Um, you know, pretty amazing. So pomegranate, persimmon, avocado, looks like some type of flowering cherry, longan, and another really healthy persimmon down there at the end. Going here onto the next swale, this is the same thing, Fakahatchee grass, and then it's been interplanted with sunshine mimosa, perennial plena, and then on the bottom side of the swale, we have the fruit trees. So on this one, we have a cold hardy avocado, Brooksville guava, Black Suriname Cherry, another black um, cold hardy guava. And on the right side here, we've got wax myrtle, nitrogen fixing, interplanted with different varieties of bamboo, along with Caliandra. That's another nitrogen fixer. These do really great for us. That's why I said we put them in that buffer. They're gonna grow up quick, they're gonna fix nitrogen, and they're gonna give us that little bit of privacy we also want. And you can see here how well, I mean, for now, I think this site was actually two degrees colder than me. I think they lost about seven fruit trees here. And I want to tell you all right off the bat, they knew the risk they were taking with those fruit trees. Um, we've even reinstalled a couple of star fruit. That's the only thing sensitive we'd put back into the system. For the most part, we've added cold hardy avocados, more loquats, more olives, more peaches, more plums. The stuff that's kind of tried and true that we're not gambling with. Here's some of that katuk. And of course they just started mowing the grass. I'm really sorry about that. I do not have time to come back. So I'm going to have to just stay close to the mic and finish this up for y'all. The katook is delicious. Definitely a nice little snack as you're walking out here in the garden. And I don't know if you guys can see that flower, but there's a flower in a rack up in there. And we'll walk around and look at some racks real quick. Um, you know, rack of bananas right here. Rack of bananas over here, kind of far away. New avocado, rack of bananas. Kind of a baby rack of bananas, not really much to show off with that one. Going over here onto this side, got some of those elephant ears. More of the shampoo ginger. Here's a purple possum passion fruit. We did lose a bunch of these last year. This is the only one that didn't die. We did replant 12 of those. That's one 
if it dies in the freeze, no big deal. It usually fruits so quickly, you know, we can replant them. We get so many fruits, it's worth losing that one. You know, one vine can produce up to like 2,000 fruits in a year. Typically those fruits start coming in by the second year, but they're very abundant. So if we do lose them, it's definitely something we're gonna replant. I'll show you guys some more racks of bananas. Woo! And these are some of the healthiest bananas I've ever seen. They're definitely giving these things the love, the attention, the food they want. Another rack of bananas. And I want you all to know, don't forget, this place looked exactly like mine. I mean, this was like Armageddon. The bananas were all smoked. Everything was brown out here. The only thing that was green were the trees and the palmettos. Everything has come back after the cold here. So it's, you know, it's definitely quite promising, especially for things like bananas that we get a little upset. You know, you maybe have that three months of brown. They've, you know, specifically expressed, they don't care. They like the bananas so much when they come back, they're big and they're beautiful. We'll take nine months of being green. Um, we added some new Kerry star fruit. We added a Fuang Tung star fruit, and we added a Shrikam Banging star fruit. So that was something they definitely wanted to gamble and risk with again. They're a little more cold hardy. So if we have a mild winter and they get established, all of my star fruits came back fine. They'll be okay here also. This is the lesser Galangal. There is some Japotacaba mixed in here. There's the native coffee, regular firebush, uh, Malanga, or Taro on that one, I'm sorry. Big bananas, this is a dwarf variety. I believe this is probably the Namwa. They all do have some old tags on them. Obviously this is a much bigger banana here on this side. Here's some really dwarf bananas. Here's one of our Japotacabas I was talking about. Turmeric with flowers. Something else I wanted to point out to you guys, and I'm not the only one that has seen this, you know, I've had some other experts in the field, my good friend Josh Jameson over at the Heart Institute. He's also just posted about this recently. Pineapples in the understory, um, they actually do quite well. They will still fruit in the understory. They can handle that dappled light and they took the cold really well. That was something that Penny and Dan told me here on this site. You know, they got some brown edges on them. A couple of them looked really crappy. They all came back fine and now they're harvesting pineapples. So pro tip, definitely worth trying those in the understory. So I would say I'm a little bit over halfway on the property. Actually, I would call this the halfway point. That's the end of that swale at the bottom of the hill. So everything y'all see over to this side was a jungle. Um, there might have been one or two little paths, but otherwise it was very thick brush. They're talking about putting cabana out here. They're talking about putting a pond out here. You know, obviously a couple of swings, you know, a, a space to come out and actually enjoy, you know, this beautiful garden. Um, there's lots of native persimmon coming up around here, native pawpaw coming up around here. We've left all of those alone. This whole place is actually covered in dragonflies this morning. Those guys are out here working. And there is a couple of bananas that we added to some of these more cleaned out beds up here at the top of the hill. And those are pups from the bananas that are over there in the garden. So the clients didn't have to buy those. We dug them up, replanted them, added them over here. Next year when I come back and make y'all a follow up video, you know, that one banana, it's gonna be five bananas, 10 bananas. There is a perfect number to manage bananas, but I'm just expressing, you know, how quickly they, they create ehos or babies. I noticed over here on this banana and that banana and that banana, that they have a stack of brush on the bottom of them. And I could tell from looking at them from back there, it's Mexican sunflower. So that Dan has been out here chopping and dropping, putting that biomass, that nitrogen on these bananas since we were here just five days ago. So like I said, these clients are really connected to the system. It's pretty awesome. Here's one of those native pawpaws. This one kind of, I believe will start patching in this area. I just got some pawpaws from my farm. They have not showed up there natively. Uh-oh, one of the coolest new additions to the garden, guys. Garden party time. How many but huh? How many of you guys have ever seen a food forest with a disco ball? Dan and Penny are not playing around out here. That's a pretty awesome element. We all need one of those in our garden, huh? More bananas crushing it. Oh, I see more Mexican sunflower here on the bottom. That's what I was talking about. There's that biomass. And you know, what y'all are seeing here on the ground, there might be a weed here or a weed there, but we just weeded this place really well. You know, that's all mimosa peanut. You know, I can see the yellow flowers from here. 
popping over there on the other side of the path. They're doing really well. Um, I believe this is arrowroot on the edge here. Got some pineapples on the inside. Obviously some more bananas. Turk's cat pie biscuits. And this is the galangal. You know, this is the one that's really popular in the Tom Ka soup. And this is like, I just want y'all to see this, like two foot taller than me and an evergreen ginger. So definitely a really cool one for the landscape. Firebush, malanga, of course the amazing sweet almond that doesn't seem to be overpowering the fish smell out here this morning, but that's not a big deal. The plants really love the fish emulsion. I believe they're even doing some compost tea out here. Here is a really happy persimmon. This guy's been pushing lots of new growth. I mean, this whole shoot is brand new this year. Kind of starting to get a nice shape to it. Might need to take a couple of pups off that banana to give her a little more room. But a really happy, good looking persimmon there. It's really amazing what happens to this mulch without being turned and just sitting here. Um, it's really some incredible stuff. And this is what I'm talking about again. And this is that really squishy soil. And this is what I was looking to see. When I pulled back this ground cover the other day, I mean, you can barely buy stuff that looks like this. This is almost pure worm castings. Um, and the really amazing part about it is, I couldn't get to the sand. I mean, look at this. Look at what we're building here. This is alive. You know, this is healthy. This is feeding plants. This is some of the most amazing soil I think I've ever seen in Florida. Quite impressive, guys. So these bamboos really add an awesome tropical element to the garden. And it's really a shame that bamboo gets such a bad reputation because of these running varieties. I mean, these clumping varieties are never gonna expand past this 10 foot mark. They're gorgeous in the landscape. They're very useful. Privacy breaks, wind breaks, building material, snakes in the garden, all kinds of different elements. And that's why we call bamboo one of the most useful crops in the world. I'll give you guys a little peek over here on the new planting and we're gonna wrap this guy up for you. Here's a jackfruit seedling coming back. that spiraling ginger all right guys so next year's follow-up video is gonna be when I put another swell in on this side and we come back to expand upon the irrigation and add some more plants they definitely want to start planting some more things inside these beds that's the only thing he did say it's a little bit bare right now I mean they love it they're totally excited um, you know this is another more useful part of the property they have another area where they can take the golf cart now but they want it to look like it is over there on the other side and who can blame them for that so a lot of the material we'll be using over here on this side we'll actually be taking from the other side we're going to propagate some of that stuff we're going to take up some of those bananas and we'll bring them over here to this side and start to include them in some of these beds but there's lots of neat spaces and nooks here you know like they had mentioned for that pond element possibly a gazebo i think we probably put 300 yards of mulch in here and you know, this is a wild area we did not get into too deep. And the other wild area we didn't get into too deep is just right over here along that south edge. Um, once all of this comes in dense, we're gonna actually move some of this bamboo, finish cleaning this out, and finish cleaning this out over here. Um, when Dan originally had the idea of putting the bamboo here, I don't think we ever had the intention of clearing the entire property. But like I said, they've you know had so much fun. They've gotten so much into this. You know, they want to go further with it. They want to take it to the next level. I mean, how amazing is this to have your friends over and to take them out here in your private botanical garden? Um, I love working on this site. I love working for these clients. They're the absolute best. I love working near my house. It doesn't happen very often. This is the dream job. They're actually going to put another gate in over there so they have another golf cart access. And this is that buffer that we put in over here on that south end of the property. So that's all those plants I was calling out to y'all earlier. Simpson stoppers, wax myrtles, bamboos, all different species. That will be a dense planting once it comes in. And then we have another area here to clean out. And it is worth putting the time and the effort 
into cleaning these projects out properly. You know, it takes us a little bit more work. It definitely takes us a little more time, but we work hard to get those Smilax roots out of the ground, you know, to stop those things from coming back up, even though, you know, I know they have an amazing edible tip. I love them. They just didn't want them, you know, growing onto their bananas or in these parts of the gardens. There is parts where they're letting the Smilax grow. So, you know, I know it's useful, um, but it's not useful right here in this system at this time. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this little follow-up video of this epic site with swales in Pasco County. Um, if you liked the video, don't forget, like, subscribe, share, and if you want to support us, don't forget we do have a Patreon now. All the links in the description down below. Don't forget, guys, pound dirt.